The R-330 having arrived, we'll call the House Tax Committee to order. We're going to just flip the agenda here. We're going to go with uh, Torkelson first, House File 861. And so, members, we're looking at one thing in the Torkelson bill, and that's taxes. That's what we're looking at. So, Chair Torkelson, welcome to the Tax Committee. Uh, if you could please introduce yourself and present your bill. The tax provisions only. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for hosting me. I am Paul Torkelson, uh, House Representative of District 16B and Chair of the tax, uh, Transportation Finance Committee. Uh, there are some tax provisions within our omnibus bill that we passed out of committee dealing with uh, sales tax and dedicating sale, a variety of sales taxes and other taxes to transportation and it's my understanding Mr. Chair that that work actual work will be done within your tax bill the awesome wonderful whatever it's called I forgot your theme song already <laughs> Mr. Together. Chair but I know it's a good one come together come together right now <laughs> for tax relief for tax relief <laughs> yes okay like members we have a quorum will officially call the house tax committee to order uh, Representative Schultz moves the minutes of March 24th, 20 and 17. Any discussion? Hearing none, all fair say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you, members. Okay, I will now move House File 861. So we have the bill before us. So I understand there are some amendments that will be, that are actually in your packet. Uh, do we have, we have an A, Representative Torkelson, we have an A22 amendment and we have a, a25 amendment. Representative Hurtas, is that yours? A20? Yours is 20. Oh. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I will move the H0861825 amendment, which takes the tax items out of the bill itself. So, any discussion on that? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. We now have. Uh, before we do the other amendments, why don't we hear from your bill? Normally, I do the amendments first, but let's let's talk about your bill, the tax provisions, and then we'll take amendments up from uh, members that have amendments. So, to your bill, sir, tax provisions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I was very very good testimony. Lecture, Thank you. But uh, the tax <laughs> provisions do involve uh, auto sales tax or rental car. Special sales tax, rental car sales tax, and motor vehicle lease taxes, all of which uh, actually, if we took them all, would total over 450 million, Mr. Chair. But our target is 450, so we're only taking 450 million, Mr. Chair, to dedicate to transportation. Okay. That's very kind of you. So. Okay, so let, we do have a couple more amendments here. So, members, we did take the tax provisions out. I have a an amendment here I'd just like to offer. Well, who else has amendments? Let's do others first. I should be last. <laughs> Representative Hurtas, you want to pass out the Hurtas amendment? I believe 826, Representative Hurtas. Let's just get an idea here for the amendments. We have we have the Hurtas amendment. We have the my amendment, 822. Are there any other amendments that we have? I have, Mr. Chairman, two in the past, and then... We did the 25. We did the 25. the tax out. What's the status of the other one? We haven't done it yet. I'll present that after the hurt cost. I wasn't even in today. Thank you, Chair Carlson. Remember, did a great. Okay, do members have the 826 amendment? Okay, Representative Hurt Toss, to your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Chair Torkelson. The A26 amendment uh, simply makes a technical change in the amount of compensation that a commercial property owner in condemnation can recover as part of the appraisal fees. Currently, it's written as $5,000, and it's quite ordinary to have commercial appraisals come in at substantially higher costs than that, uh, even as much as forty dollars or $50,000. This amendment raises the limit that can be recoverable from $5,000 to $20,000, and that's the amendment, sir. Chair Torkelson to the amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the author has not spoken to me about this amendment. Uh, I'm not sure if this is any longer part of my bill, Mr. Chair. Is this what part of the bill does this go against? We're going to check that out. This is a 
President Hurtas, just just not questioning a member's motives or intentions by any means, but how does this fit into this bill, Section 117? This, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The amendment uh, addresses the uh, NASH provision that is tucked into the Transportation Omnibus Bill, and that is uh, House File 2058, and the fiscal note on it uh, was negligible because most condemnations occur at the local level. And um, Chair Torkelson, uh, I discussed this with your CA this morning and he told me to proceed with the amendment. So I apologize that I haven't been able to connect with you, but he said it would be fine to proceed. Mr. Chair, if we could have staff Mr. address the amendment, I think it might be helpful. Mr. Hines or Ms. Dalton? Uh, perhaps Mr. Burris would be willing to... Uh, okay, Mr. Burris, if you join forward. us, please state your name and who you represent for the record, please, sir. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, Matt Burris with House Research. So there is a uh, provision in House File 861. It's on page 40. And that provision would um, have the effect of, of requiring various types of payments related to the eminent domain process for light rail transit and bus rapid transit projects. Uh, the amendment makes a change that's also in the world of eminent domain on appraisal okay. fees and what the maximum fee is. Um, so in uh, reviewing that amendment, I think there's actually another section that would also need to be modified at some point. There are actually two different spots where the uh, maximum appraisal amount is it's currently set at $5,000 and this is one of those sections and the other one is being cross-referenced in the uh, language in House File 861 in, in uh, Section 3 of the, of the bill. So that, that cross-reference is into the uh, another provision around setting of the um, the uh, appraisal amount, and that's a, a slightly separate process in which uh, is uh, kind of preliminary to when there's a, a court case and a court determination of damages, where there are a couple of appointed commissioners to that go through and figure out what the um, uh, what the um, damages level should be and what the appraisal level should be. Um, so the the language that's in section three essentially establishes that those limits under that other process for light rail and bus rapid transit projects would um, apply in in, um, in the uh, in those cases. Okay. Does anybody uh, from the audience wish to testify on behalf of this amendment or with concerns? Okay. Uh, did the department want to talk about? Since we stripped it all out, yeah, the tax permit. Oh, okay, okay, you'll have the opportunity to do that, but not on this amendment. Questions from members? Uh, Representative Petersburg. Thank you. I'm, I'm still a little bit confused. If we're just talking about the tax provisions here, is this a, a, a pertinent, uh, a valid amendment? And I guess that's a question I'm still inquiring about. It, it's yeah. It's it, it. This would be in order. Okay. Yeah, it's to the bill. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Uh, if not, uh, Representative Hurtas moves the H zero eight six one A. Representative Torkels, any thoughts? Uh, no thoughts, Mr. Chair. I'll follow your lead. I, okay. Your committee, I would guess, would follow your lead. Doesn't always happen. But it's, really? It's a happy thought. Uh, so I'll move the H0861A26 amendment. All in favor say aye. Oh, excuse me, Chair Carlson. Mr. Chairman, I just have a question. You asked if the department had any comments, but it, wouldn't this be uh, more directly uh, an issue uh, for the uh, Department of Transportation? Because yes. they're the ones that are going to be. Do any departments wish to test yeah. or uh, make comments on this? Thank you, Chair Carlson. Please state your name and who you represent for the record, please, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Eric Redeen with the Department of Transportation. 
and um, this this would impact um, acquisitions by not only the Department of Transportation but I believe any uh, government entity using Chapter 117, which would include local governments as well. Um, I, I'm not familiar. It sounds like there is a fiscal note that was prepared on on uh, a bill that was introduced. I, I haven't. I'm not familiar with that fiscal note, but there would be um, a fiscal impact to the department to uh, if we increase the amount that we're paying for these commercial appraisals. Sure, Carl. And Mr. Chairman, would it uh, have an impact on uh, our higher education institutions? Mr. Rudine? Um Mr. Chair and Representative Carlson, I believe it would. I would. I believe it would apply to any uh, public agency that's that's doing uh, condemnation work. And Mr. Mr. Chairman, Carlson? I do know that uh, with Metro, uh, they were looking at uh, the possibility of having some difficulty. Uh, Acquiring some land for a parking ramp, and uh, I don't know if they ultimately used eminent domain, but because they rarely use it, they worked with the uh, Department of Transportation because they have more experience with eminent domain than the Minsky system did. But I do know that we've had um, some of our colleges and universities that are basically landlocked, <laughs> and through the years they've been acquiring space. You know, St. Cloud is surrounded by development as is one on I think you said one time that that was the uh, institution you went to um, I went to Mankato that institution went up on the they acquired land up above outside of the town and uh, so avoided some of the things that a Winona or a St. Cloud or Moorhead have had to deal with and I know the university has had to acquire space from time to time now the frequency of eminent domain I have no idea but it sounds like it could have an impact uh, when they do. Well, th this is what I would suggest, members, and we'll see uh, how you vote on this. But I'd say uh, let's put it on. Then it keeps going. The discussion keeps going. And if it if it uh, causes heartburn, we'll let uh, Chair Torkelson take care of it. <laughs> any, any further discussion, Chair Torkelson? Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, for those remarks. Uh, and I, I don't know enough about this to know how it might affect uh, other committees. Uh, but uh, it's your committee, Mr. Chair. Uh, we can always deal with it in the future. It won't be in my committee that long. <laughs> okay, so I'll renew my motion at H0861826 uh, that we pass, or we don't pass it. Uh, do we add the amendment to the bill? Adopt the amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. no. Motion prevails. <laughs> Item next. Okay, the 822 amendment, uh, this is my amendment. Uh, are there any other amendments that we have before we send Chair Torkelson on his way? Okay, this is the 822 amendment. Uh, this is brought to us by uh, the auto dealers. And what it does is it allows uh, the auto dealers, for many, many years they've had a, a dock fee, they call it dock fee at 75. This would allow them to uh, raise it up to a maximum of 150. If you look on uh, 1.20, oh, they, they can put it there. Uh, anyone wish to testify on behalf of this or with concerns? Department? Okay, so with that, questions for members? Uh, Representative Wills. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just wondering if maybe you can enlighten us on, I know it's in the language here, but if, for the record, what the fee covers and when it was changed last, you know, just a little history. Okay. First of all, I would, I would, well, I'll tell you what, let's, let's go with some testimony. Please state your name and who represents the record, please. Certainly, Mr. Chair and members, my name is Amber Backus. I'm the Director of Government Affairs with the Minnesota Automobile Dealers Association and here on behalf of its 370 franchise dealerships. Uh, the document fee um, is, does not go to the state. It is an amount authorized by the state that our dealers can collect to compensate them for the time it takes to process registering titles, do the sales tax collection um, when you are purchasing a new motor vehicle. Um, it's been on the book since 1987. It was last raised in 2008. Uh, so it's been nine years since the last increase and currently we are only one of nine states states that caps this limit most other states don't um, and we are well below the national average in terms of what is charged by dealers around the country. Representative Wills? 
or Senate Block Floor. Um, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And it, it looks to me like this is increasing the cost of, of buying a car by $75 or up to $75. And I'm wondering um, if Ms. Bacchus can explain any uh, uh, administrative burdens that have gotten bigger over the last eight years that would justify doubling it. To the witness. Certainly, Mr. Chair and Representative Loeffler. Uh, again, this isn't the mandatory amount. It's up to uh, $150 that could be charged, but since the last increase, we have seen significant changes, um, particularly at the federal level in terms of, of regulations with the passage of the Dodd-Frank Act and new provisions put forward by the Consumer Finance Protection, Protection Agency, uh, as well as um, changes in wheelage taxes, filing fees, and technology surcharges. And this has been especially a, a concern for our smaller dealers who don't have dedicated staff to this. And um, the Probably the big issue that brought this to light is over the past year, there's been a backlog in titling registrations at driver and vehicle services of up to three months. Um, and when that happens, our dealers have more instances where they're getting calls from both the consumers and the banks to continually check on this, uh, on the status of their titling transaction, which takes considerably longer. Already, these uh, processes can take two and a half to four hours um, to process on behalf of consumers. And with that backlog, it added significantly to the cost this past year. Representative Loeffler. Um, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't think it, I'm persuaded yet. Chair Carlson. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, to the uh, testifier, uh, you've emphasized twice in the last couple of minutes that it's up to, mm -hmm. and it's really not that uh, clear in my view. It says they may charge a fee or document administration fee that you can't go in excess of 150. Um, at the current level, what kind of language was there and was it an up to 75 or? Um, Mr. Chair, the existing, what, Ms. excuse me, Mr. Chair, Representative Carlson, the existing language is in section one of the amendment and that was also saying in excess of $75 for services. So the same language. So Chair Carlson. Mr. Chairman, did anybody, be, anybody charge less? Uh, Mr. Okay. Chair, there are consumers that don't have to pay it for all, at all if they negotiate with their dealer. So it really does vary by the dealership, the amount of staffing, the amount it takes to process these transactions. I couldn't speak to each dealer individually, but I know some consumers don't pay anything. Chair sure, Carlson. Um, I can see a scenario where a dealer could say that, um, you know, state law provides for this. Um, I'm not sure how many consumers, I just learned something here today but that would be a negotiable item. I've got in my glove box the last car I bought. I'm going to have to look and see what kind of a fee I paid, but um, I probably just accepted that that was a document fee and probably paid the 75, not knowing it was negotiable. And Mr. Chair, Representative Carlson, we do sell forms to our members, and we're very clear in making sure it's not interpreted in a way that would look like it's a required fee. But the customer coming in, uh, Mr. Chairman, wouldn't necessarily know that, and they could just say that's the fee we charge for all the documentation and what have you, and collecting the sales tax, and we wouldn't know it's negotiable. The next car I buy, I suspect whether it's 75 or 150, that's now become a negotiable item from my perspective, but uh, uh, I think it could be clear that it's, at some point, if the amendment goes on and it uh, moves forward, that um, that it's up to, so that it's clear to the consumer coming in that that's a negotiable item. Thank you, uh, Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and either for you, I, I, I presume your your amendment was this a bill that was introduced during committee, or it was kind of I don't remember hearing it necessarily. Ms. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Kosnick, it was a bill that was introduced, um, but it uh, came in and was referred to Commerce, and there was not a enough time before the deadlines to have it come to transportation because of the switching of the language from Section 53C to 168. Didn't have that good an author either. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any questions from members? Representative Hurtas. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'd just like to point out that oftentimes when uh, you negotiate a, a sale price on a vehicle, uh, most consumers are informed what the sales tax is going to be and what the license will cost, but I think this is the type of fee that will, uh, if authorized, will go to the maximum right away and uh, be not unlike many of the ridiculous fees that are in real estate transactions. Thank you. Any other questions for members? Department need to testify on this amendment? 
<laughs> okay, I'll, any other discussion from members? I'll renew my motion that we adopt the H0861822 amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Motion prevails. Okay, we have the bill as amended. Any further discussion? Yes, sure. uh, the department would like to make a few, or oh, discussion? Let the department go first. Well, let's have the department wrap it up. Chair Garofalo. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And Representative Tarkelson, thank you for all your work that you've put in on this bill. Uh, and uh, I just, uh, my much heralded network of spies tells me that the CTIB board is meeting an executive session on March 31st of this week. And without going into the details of that, there is obviously, uh, uh, there's some important deadlines that are coming up regarding a potential sales tax increase. And I'm wondering, Representative um, Torkelson, do you know when your bill is gonna be up in Ways and Means? Chair Torkelson? Uh, this week, I believe, is possibly as soon as Wednesday. But I'm, I can't confirm that I exactly. Chair Garofalo? Thank you. So, Mr. Chairman and um, Representative Torkelson, uh, and we'll talk offline about this. And if you're from outside the seven county metro, you can just tune out and not pay attention. And maybe you're already tuning out and not paying attention to me. Um, <laughs> but obviously, what happens with CTIP, if it's dissolved, how it's dissolved, how those funds are appropriated, what it means is incredibly important, not just to our region, but to the state of Minnesota. And I have serious and deep concerns about how um, the CTIP board has been acting and the actions they're taking. And so no member of this committee or the legislature or advocates should be surprised if uh, you, start, you see some amendments in ways and means when this bill is up in committee. I'm just forewarned and I think I believe in a fair fight. So uh, that's all I got, Mr. Chairman. Okay, other questions for members? Uh, Chair Carlson. Yeah, uh, I would uh, represent Knobloch Hill to a question. Uh, I remember tomorrow is the education bill in ways and means. What's the second bill? Chair Knobloch, to the Carlson question. I'm wondering if it wasn't transportation, but I'm. Well, Representative Chair Carlson, Knobloch. I'm wondering now too. <laughs> Chair Carlson. <laughs> well, <laughs> my memory may be faulty, but I, you can check. I think you might be up tomorrow, but I'm not fine. I won't swear to that. I'm not the one that sets the agenda. That's why I asked Representative Knobloch to yield. There was a time, but not currently. Questions for members? Was there anybody from the audience who wants to testify for concerns? Representative Schultz, and then we'll go to Mr. Cummings. Representative Thank Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chair Tor Torgelson, if your target was set higher, would you be spending more money on transportation and taking more money from the general fund? Chair Torkelson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. Uh, yes. Representative Schultz. Thank you. Other questions for members? Okay, we'll Mr. go to Mr. Chair, if I could oh, just add Representative that, Torkelson. that uh, the 450 does not represent the full amount of sales tax that is generated in these areas that I described earlier. Thank you. It'd be my intention, I mean, any time members have a question, that's great, but we'll go to Mr. Cummings and then we'll have Chair Torkelson wrap it up. Mr. Cummings. Mr. Chair, good morning. Um, for the record, well, good morning. Yeah. <laughs> mm. It's morning somewhere. It's morning somewhere, Mr. Morning Chair. Somewhere. For the record, my name is Paul Cummings and I'm the tax policy manager at the Minnesota Department of Revenue. I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to testify. Mr. Chair, before I worked at the Department of Revenue, I was a house staffer that worked for a tax committee. So I do understand that um, moving all of the tax provisions into one bill um, d does make for maybe easier passage of the multiple bills that need to be passed. But in every time in which there has been a sort of a talking about it, there has been a discussion about a transportation proposal. And that's what I wanted to briefly talk about today. And I will be brief, Mr. Chair. Uh, there seems to be um, consensus that greater investment is needed to maintain and improve our transportation system. To provide that investment, there are many types of funding that are um, currently constitutionally dedicated. Constitutionally dedicated sources of funding for transportation are limited and include raising the gas tax, license tabs, and motor vehicle sales tax. Non-dedicated sources such as using the general fund force trade-offs between priorities such as education, nursing homes, and the environment. History has shown us that the use of funding which is not constitutionally dedicated to roads and bridges can be siphoned off for other priorities. 
For example, in the year 2000, when the state had a general fund surplus, $282 million in general funds were appropriated to MnDOT for trunk highway construction. However, 40% of those funds were canceled in 2013 to fill a budget deficit. Making transportation infrastructure investments with an unstable non-dedicated funding source represents a short-term business decision as Minnesota's road and bridge um, assets require long-term stable funding in order to plan, construct, and maintain our overall system. Mr. Chair, um, the Governor Dayton has another approach and I can go into that if, um, if asked. But Governor Dayton remains concerned that a solution that shifts funding from education and health care to transportation is not sustainable. He remains committed to reaching common ground to fund a long-term comprehensive transportation solution that builds a better Minnesota for everywhere, everyone everywhere in this state. Um, if we do not provide more dedicated funds for roads and bridges um, at the pump or when we buy a license or vehicle or locally through Roots. property taxes, the other alternative is to live with the continually degrading transportation system. I wanted to note that while we do have a large budget surplus, um, federal policy unknowns create significant risk. So as um, this sort of unified transportation package moves through the legislature, we look forward to working with you, Mr. Chair, and Representative Torkelson and members, and we appreciate the opportunity to come before this committee today. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Questions for members for Mr. Cummings? Uh, Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, uh, Representative or Chair Torkelson, uh, thanks for your work on this bill uh, and the emphasis on roads and bridges. But my understanding is some of this rededicated funds uh, several decades ago used to be de dedicated to roads and bridges and then was redirected to the general fund. Is that a correct assumption? Chair Mr. Chair, Representative Grunhagen, I am not aware of that. That's certainly a possibility. Representative Grunhagen. I'll have to check my short sources, Mr. Chair. Okay. Chair Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm wondering if Mr. Cummings can remind us what the governor's proposal was for a tax increase for transportation. And how many, what taxes was he going to increase and how much was he going to uh, increase, uh, for instance, the regressive gas tax? Mr. Cummings. Uh, Mr. Chair, Governor Dayton has proposed a transportation plan to help bridge the $6 billion state highway transportation funding gap over the next 10 years with dedicated funding for roads and bridges and increased funding for transit. New funding for road and bridge construction would be provided by a 6.5% um, gross receipts tax on gasoline, bringing the current 1.25% base on the vehicle registration fees to 1.5% and raising car registration fees by $10. Um, in addition, Governor Dayton would require MnDOT to spend taxpayer money in an accountable and responsible way, finding savings of 15% for all new revenues, allowing the department to do $6 billion worth of work uh, for $5.46 billion in new revenue. Chair Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Cummings. I think um, Chair Torkelson's got the 15% savings in the bill, so I think we're finding common ground, Mr. Cummings. Um, can you tell us what the total amount of the tax increase will amount to that the governor wants to raise those, those percentages you've outlined? What is the total collection from the people of Minnesota annually? Mr. Cummings. Uh, Mr. Chair, it is uh, about $6 billion over 10 years. Chair Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll check the rest of details off online, offline. Thank you. Any other questions for members? Let's go with Mr. Cummings here at this point. They don't have Chair Torkelson to wrap it up. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Thank uh, you. Chair Torkelson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members. Uh, this is a robust, uh, substantial transportation bill. Um, you know, the aversion to using general funds seems a little unusual. Uh, we are not at all afraid and have traditionally used uh, general obligation bonds to fund transportation projects all around the, the state and those bonds are serviced by general funds. It's not at all unusual. There are 32 states in the District of Columbia that utilize substantial amounts of general funds to fund transportation in their states, including some states that spend well over $2 billion of general fund on transportation projects. With that, Mr. Chair, I thank you for hearing the bill and Mike in your committee and I look forward to bringing it to uh, Ways and Means sometime in the future. Thank you, Chair Torkelson. Uh, with that, uh, I will renew my motion that House File 861 as amended be referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Say no. no. Motion prevails. Thank you, Chair Torkelson. The bill is on its way as amended. Item next, we'll go to uh, Chair Loon will move House File uh, 890. And 
I believe we have several amendments or just one? Okay, members, the 49-2 uh, amendments being passed out. Are there any other amendments that members have on, on this bill? Okay. So, Chair Loon has moved House File 890. Chair Loon, is the H0890A49-2 amendment yours? Yes, it is, Mr. Chair. Okay, as we've done in the past, we'll, I'd like to get the bill in shape the author would like, and we will go from there. So, Chair Loon moves the H0890A49-2 amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 The motion prevails. We now have the bill as amended. <coughs> A uh, two-year bill. Now, now, I guess before we get going, Chair Loon, I'd just like to see what we have here now. Again, we're just talking about the tax provisions. Uh, is there anyone in the audience who uh, testify on behalf of the tax provisions in this bill with concerns? Uh, Department of Revenue or Transportation or Health? Any others? Okay. I think we got her covered. So, two-year bill, Chair Loon, to the tax provisions as amended. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, um, I thought I would explain just a little bit about the changes we made with the amendment and then, or do you want to talk about the tax provisions first? Uh, let's go with just the tax provisions. Okay. Okay. All right. So, um, Mr. Chair, um, Mr. Strom from uh, nonpartisan staff is with me. And just to talk about the tax provisions, obviously, the education finance bill always comes before the tax committee because we have programs that are both aid and levy. And so, obviously, that affects property taxes. Um, as part of our target, we were provided with a goal of a zero levy um, um, provision um, for the bill. And that's what we have. Um, so, there are. Um, um, there is no um, property tax or levy increase uh, in the bill, and none of that was a cha was changed at all by the amendment that was offered. So I'll have Mr. Strom, if there's any particular questions about um, the tax provisions, I'd ha be happy to have Mr. Strom uh, go through those. Okay, I think we'll go to member questions. And Mr. Cummings, you didn't need to talk about this one? No, Because you're certainly welcome to. Okay. Okay, questions for members? Uh, Representative Loeffler. Um, well, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Representative Loon. Um, I don't serve on K through 12, but with the zero levy provision and your funding school districts at less than inflation, I think it, the basic general increase is like one and a half percent per year, as I understand it. Does that mean that school districts will not be able to increase their levies except through referendum, the way your bill is structured? Chair Loon. Um, uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Loeffler, um, yes and no. <laughs> um, we do have, um, we have voter approved levies that school districts can avail themselves of. They, we also have some levies that school boards can do um, that do not require voter approval. Um, and so again, it would kind of depend on what school district you're talking about, whether that school district had um, taken all of those or in, in implemented all of those levies that they could do on their own. Um, but basically we aren't making any changes that would increase um, levy authority uh, that school districts currently have. And just, I want to make sure I'm stating that correctly, Mr. Strong. Yes. Thank Representative you. Loeffler. Thank you. Representative Marquardt, lead Marquardt. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And I don't know if this is a question for Representative Loon or Mr. Strom, but uh, what are the assumptions as far as operating referendum increases or debt service increases in property taxes? And then what would be kind of the final line of the increase that, I know the, there's not a change, but just from current law, what would be the increase from year to year? Mr. Strom. Mr. Chair, Representative Marcourt, in the K-12 world, the pay 18 taxes essentially are measured uh, over baseline. Uh, the sheet that you have from Ms. Adrian's, the House Fiscal Analyst, also compares those to the pay 17 and the pay 19 taxes. So you can see the, the totals there. The, the zero levy uh, target that Representative Loon refers to is the change from baseline. If you look at the levy sheet that's in front of you, the levy tracking sheet, you'll see that pay 18 is about $175 million higher 
then pay 17 on the overall school levies. And the two largest shares of that are in the voter approved categories. Uh, every year the Department of Education works with others to make an estimate of uh, how many levies will pass at the fall election cycle. Uh, this year they're expecting about an additional $50 million of operating referendums this November. Uh, that lines toward the top of that spreadsheet. And then on the bond elections, uh, for the sale of building bonds, uh, uh, roughly a $30 million uh, increase is expected between pay 18 and pay 17 uh, on the overall levy due to the new bond elections that will occur through the cycle. Steve Thank you. Other questions for members? To Mr. Strom or Chair Loon. Okay, so with that, uh, Chair Loon renews her motion uh, to move 890 is amended that be referred to the Ways and Means well, Committee. Uh, lead Markport. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Did, was the amendment explained? Or do it was adopted. Okay. You uh, could, you, could you would go? Chair, yeah, you I'm explain what we did? Here and, and I would. <laughs> things were moving so quickly. Oh, certainly, there, certainly. No, that's no. fine. If we uh, could explain Chair what's in the amendment. To the amendment. Thank you. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, I will. And I'll have Mr. Strom go through any any um, technical um, aspects of it if there are any. But um, basically, you know what the amendment does reflects uh, a change from uh, what the bill looked like when it left uh, House Education Finance Committee on Friday. Um, when the House or when the bill passed through Education Committee, it contained a full repeal of the voluntary pre-K uh, program. And, um, and reallocated those uh, resources, that funding in the bill to uh, the funding formula and to some other um, program priorities to provide high quality early learning. We put money into early learning scholarships, additional school readiness and that. Um, and when we finished up our work on the bill Friday, I made comments that uh, it was one step forward in the process, but I was looking forward to working with my, my colleagues, uh, uh, GOP and DFL, and with the governor's office to find common ground. Um, as I've reflected uh, on this, um, what the author's amendment does is it doesn't uh, put voluntary pre-K back in, but what it does do is provide school readiness money for those districts that were in the pilot program. So um, basically, um, you know, I, I prefer school readiness in terms of its flexibility in that for, for uh, schools to operate their programs for, again, early learners targeted to three and four year olds. And in our ongoing discussions with the governor on how best to provide early learning uh, opportunities, we have sort of agreed on a two, two uh, approach and um, two different things. One is money into school readiness, the other is into scholarships. And so uh, this would uh, continue that. But in order to, again, provide school readiness funding to those voluntary pre-K school districts that were in that pilot program, um, in order to do that, we're gonna have to scale back our increase on the formula. So as it came out of committee, it was one and a half and one and a half, and now it's one and a quarter, one and a quarter. So just so members understand that um, by adding, or by gradually trying to add a grade um, through this program, that sort of is what happens, is that takes money away from the funding formula for, for K-12. So, um, you know, I I prefer this approach for a couple of reasons, and there are, I won't get into the details about uh, early learning programs and what we fund, but um, there's a lot of questions right now about with going on to a new program, as the governor would like, how many new children we're serve, serving. And uh, to this day, I, I cannot get a number from the commissioner about how many children in the VPK programs are being served for the first time in a program or whether we're supplanting <coughs> them from other programs that we're funding. So um, again, that's that's my approach in the amendment. Again, trying to find a way to um, um, perhaps uh, an olive branch to the governor, if you will. Um, let's increase the school readiness. We'll do it for those schools. Um, it would be a goal to bring everybody up uh, as we have money to do that. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to continuing that discussion as this uh, bill moves along the process. Steve Barcourt. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chair Carlson. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, on that same amendment, it was my understanding it was just being adopted as an author's amendment and would be talked about and explained later. Um, I'm looking at uh, the uh, 
crosswinds oh. and um, Representative Loon, is that ten million uh, built into your budget? Yes, Chair it is. Loon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, Representative Carlson, it is. Representative Loon, Loon uh, what happens if there's not a buyer in the next uh, biennium that? Chair Loon. Uh, Mr. Chair and, and Representative Carlson, well, I've spoken with uh, Chair Knobloch about this, and so basically, our plan would be to have a. Um, sort of a priority list, if you will, of things that are funded in the bill that would be scaled back according to either what the sale provided for, if it was something less than 10 million, or if there was no money coming forward at all. all. So we are we are planning for either possibility. So, Chair Carl. Mr. Chairman, we, don't have, we have no idea where that uh, scale back, uh, scaling back would take place then. That's yet to be defined. Is that what I heard you say, uh, Representative Loon? Chair Loon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. It's not reflected in the legislative language here. Um, I may have something more definite uh, for ways it means. Uh, Chair Carl. Oh, Mr. Chair, one of the reasons I uh, raised the question, um, I know that $10 million was on the spreadsheet, but it, it didn't appear, at least that I could see earlier, and apparently I was correct, that anywhere in the bill. Uh, so now it would be in the bill, but it's at $10 million, and it's yet to be defined then as to uh, if a sale didn't take place, what would be reduced uh, in the bill? Uh, the other uh, question I have, Representative uh, Loon, um, I heard uh, that the value of the property was much higher than uh, 10 million. Uh, I think there was an assessment uh, by someone I don't know how formal it was, but that the value of the building was something like 23 million. Uh, so my question is, how did we arrive at 10 million if uh, the building was uh, much more valuable than that? Chair Loan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Carlson, well, as you, I'm sure, recall, uh, having been here, when, when the state bonded to build these schools, and it was part of sort of the uh, desegregation plans and uh, from a, a lawsuit or threatened lawsuit. And so when these integration districts were formed, um, both West Metro and the East Metro Integration District or EMID, schools were built. And so integration schools were created and they were operated by these integration districts as a whole. What we've seen over the last few years is the uh, integration uh, districts, the EMEDs and WEMEPs of, of our state did not want to continue operating schools. And so these schools have then been conveyed to either the school district where those schools reside or some other arrangements have been made where schools have step, districts have stepped forward to continue operating them. But um, the requirement from um, as I understand it, with uh, state bonded property, is that if the property is conveyed, it must be continued to be used for the same purpose, so as an integration um, school. And so that puts certain parameters and requirements on a school district that would take it on. They, they would not be free to use it for any purpose that they would like, and I think that does have an impact on how much a school may be willing to, to pay for the property. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I'm quite familiar with the history of the issue because I was the author of the bill years ago that uh, created East and West Metro for integration uh, purposes. That was uh, The idea was it would be voluntary and they were basically formed as magnet schools and I do know that uh, the situation uh, has now changed and uh, either uh, last biennium or the biennium before we conveyed uh, a school in the Robbinsdale district. Um, my recollection was that there was no charge, but uh, maybe Mr. Strum uh, remembers that. I wasn't the author of the, uh, the bill, even though I represent part of the Robbinsdale district uh, that uh, conveyed it to the Robbinsdale schools. In fact, I think I may have been a co-author, but uh, uh, my recollection was that there was no fee for that transfer, although there was some repair and betterment that needed to be done by whoever the new owner was going to be. Um, 
So I suppose you might say there was a modest cost uh, if in fact that's what happened, but maybe Mr. Strom remembers the history. If not, he can get back to me. Mr. Strom? Mr. Chair, Representative Carlson, yes, there was no cost uh, at the conveyances for the other three facilities, the two fair facilities, the Harambe facility, and then when Crosswinds was conveyed from EMID to the Purpich Academy. Okay, and Mr. Carl. Chairman, the fair school, um, was there some uh, repair that needed to be done, roof or something? I, I, something like a million or a million and a half comes to the back of my mind that was needed to get the uh, building in good form, but uh, Mr. Strong? maybe that didn't happen. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Carlson, there was not specific legislation regarding that. I do believe you're correct that the Robbinsdale School District uh, paid for that out of its capital budget, but we'll double check that for you. Yeah. Sure. So there may have been, I, my recollection, Mr. Chairman, was that there was a modest cost because they acquired it, but there wasn't a sale price. We've been conveying these with uh, without charge. Now I'm trying to, Mr. Chairman, remember, um, because when we're dealing with bonding, this is quite an important issue. Um, my recollection was that I carried that legislation sometime in the late 1990s and that the bonds probably weren't issued until 2000 or the early 2000s. And so the question would be, uh, what's the status of those bonds? Because when we issue bonds, they're generally 20 year bonds. And uh, do we have any uh, liability yet uh, relative to the uh, bonds for the uh, original uh, construction? And again, uh, maybe either the author, if she's looked into it, or Mr. Strom. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, Strom. Representative Carlson, we are looking into that. You are correct that the, uh, that the first laws regarding the EMID districts were in 1998. If you look on page 98 of the bill, you'll see that uh, uh, the essentially the legislative history is uh, uh, reprinted there for the years that those bond sales were and uh, uh, Chair Knobloch at the time during the last couple of years of those sales uh, the final amounts for the I believe the brickwork and one other part of the of the crosswind school were done uh, when he was the chair uh, we are checking into how much if any of the bond remains oftentimes the state uh, uh, bonds are entirely uh, uh, essentially defeased by the by before the 20 years is up. Uh, so we've got a we've got a request into management and budget to see how much, if any, remains on the on the bonding for the Crosswind School. Yeah, sure, Mr. Carlson. Chairman, I think these are uh, important issues that uh, we need to have um, some understanding of or have it on the table. At at least uh, we do front end load the bonds. We pay, uh, I think, the first five years 40% off, but then my understanding as a general rule, then uh, the balance is uh, prorated over the other 15, 15 years, hence a 20 year bond. So uh, that's why it's important to know if we're going to build this into the budget at 10 million. Uh, there are several questions. One, here we're selling it when historically we haven't to other school districts, so that's a question in my view of some equity. Uh, the other question is, though, if the bonds, if I recall, were issued probably in the early 2000s um, as to what the status is, what kind of a debt the state still owes, because we may not net out even if we did find a buyer in the next two years at a full 10 million. And I'm not sure what happens if we um, pay or attempt to pay some bonds off um, early. I, uh, I know one time we attempted to do something like that many years ago and something totally unrelated to this, but uh, um, some of the bondholders were not happy. Um, involved, I think, either Bemidji or St. Cloud State and some heating facilities or something, and the bondholders, because it would have an impact on their taxes if they were paid off early and I think one of the colleges no longer or didn't move ahead with the construction and then the question was do you pay the bonds off early or not and if you're a bondholder you buy them they're tax exempt so you buy them with the idea of holding them um, until they're mature for tax reasons and uh, we ran into some difficulty on that issue back then so I'm not sure we could even pay them off early if we wanted to or that we wouldn't get some pushback at any rate. So Mr. Chairman, I'll, uh, I'll stop there. It looks like the, uh, the author of the bill, the chair of uh, uh, the committee is going to 
provide us with more information and maybe the, when the bill is up with ways and means we'll have some answers to some of these questions. So thank you for uh, by digressing a bit on it, but this is an important uh, principle that's uh, built into the bill when we begin to uh, sell public buildings and what that means when we perhaps have some debt. So thank you. Chair Knobloch. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, just briefly on this uh, issue of the bonds being paid off early, it's my understanding that for general obligation bonds such as finance this, uh, you're correct, Representative Carlson, they're 20-year bonds, but it's standard procedure that we've got something written in that gives the state the right to de-fees or pay off the bonds after 10 years. And uh, our interest rates have been steadily falling for many years, and these uh, bonds were issued back in 2000, 2002, something like that, as was mentioned. You know, I, I guess I'd be very surprised if the bonds, when they hit their 10-year mark, weren't refinanced and then uh, de fees so that this uh, isn't an issue. But uh, as uh, Chair Loon mentioned, uh, we are going to get some more information on it. Uh, and, and Mr. Chairman, I, I didn't say that you couldn't do it. I just said we had way back when. I think, but the more I think about it, it was either St. Cloud or Bemidji. Um, some people may remember uh, we were going to heat with wood fiber and what have you, and that just didn't materialize very well. Um, but there was what I, what I said was there was pushback from some of the bondholders I think at the time because they were concerned about them being paid off early. The more I think about it, I'm not sure if they were um, general obligation bonds or if they were revenue bonds of some sort uh, in that particular case. But uh, but at any rate, if we still have an obligation, uh, we may not net out at the 10 million is my main point. But thank you. Are there any other questions for members on House File 890 as amended? <clears throat> Representative Loon uh, renews her motion that we refer House File 890 as amended to the Committee on Ways and Means. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion prevails. Members, uh, tomorrow at regular time, regular room, we have three Department of Revenue bills, policy and technical bills. Uh, with that, members, thank you for your work today. Come together, good government all the time, we're adjourned. <laughs>